Hello, YouTube land, and welcome to the Get In and Get Out Nintendo podcast, episode 52, right here at the Force in Unison Gaming Channel. And of course, joining me like always, the man, the legend, Caliones. How you doing, Caliones? Hey, how you doing, Dantes? How you doing, everybody? And yes, uh, we had a... A brand new little snippet, like Cool Drummer said on the chat. Uh, that was a new one that Dantes worked on. And I mean, just to kind of give it a little bit more flavor to our channel, since we're on podcast number 52, uh, basically, I mean, if you count it as a year, 52 weeks, uh, I mean, it's been longer than that, that we've been, uh, yeah, like on air uh, in doing this. But I mean, it was it was about time for us to, to make a change. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Of course, Caliones says, I've been working on it. I edited it. But Caliones, of course, this the new logo, the sweet new logo, of course. So uh, uh, it's a team effort, my friends. And uh, yes, it was GameCube. GameCube, cool drummer. Nice, nice. Uh, you, you notice the, the music. It's basically we took the GameCube intro and then found a song that remixed it. And we thought it was cool. I think, I think the, the GameCube intro is iconic in the Nintendo land. In the Nintendo peeps, so we wanted to give a little bit of homage to it. But with that, well, Cal- yeah, go ahead, Cal- no, but I was, I was going to say, like, um, maybe for the purposes of the intro, I mean, there wasn't really any other iconic uh, intro from Nintendo, so that was about the only one that, that we could choose. And I think that the Switch one is too new uh, to use it right now, so so that's why we went with the GameCube one. That is correct. And uh, before we start, Cal- I just wanted to pump up two games that I got. This weekend, I call it Nintendo Day, Nintendo Friday. I don't understand why you had two big games coming out the same day, Nintendo. It just doesn't make sense. But anyway, Octopath Traveler and uh, uh, Captain Toad in the house. Hopefully play. We're going to talk about Octopath Traveler. Captain Toad also came out. Uh, we're not going to talk specifically to it because it's more of a, of a, a port. We did a couple new stages, but we can say at least the Metacritic on Captain Toad is 81, which is not bad. But we'll talk more in depth about Octopath Traveler, which I am pumped for, Caliones. But with that said, Caliones, let's start with that rigmarole. I want to welcome everybody to the Get In and Get Out Nintendo podcast, episode 52, right here at the Force in Unison Gaming channel. Please remember to subscribe, like, and comment so you can make these two crazy MFs happy. Also, remember, you can get this podcast on SoundCloud and iTunes for free. Rate us over there so you can show us some love. Also, uh, we have a Facebook page called at Forcing Unison Gaming. Uh, also, go to the description box below. It's, it's, it's forming, and you guys will soon see why we've been kind of uh it's streaming kind of all over the place but it's gonna get organized peeps uh hopefully next saturday next saturday we'll stream and we'll stream and tell you the future of the forcing units and gaming channel and finally and nantes says finally go to forcing unison.wordpress.com and give some clicks and love to my boy caliones just wanted to say we are not or caliones is not officiated with shigerosnews.com anymore so please don't go (laughs) with all that said caliones are you ready i said are you ready for the no one in attendance and the 10 people watching around the world let's get ready for reggie's hot topics of the week my body my body is ready my body is ready and caliones take it away with the first hot topic well and the first hot topic and it is one of the two that you just showed all the peeps on the live stream uh, of course we're talking about octopath traveler the next big nintendo switch exclusive game that has released currently it does have an 84 on metacritic it seems to be um I mean, overall, it has 32 positive uh, scores, 35. three mixed scores. <laughs> well, um, I guess uh, they received maybe one more, but uh, yeah, 30. <laughs> uh, uh, needs to refresh it over here then. Uh, but yeah, only three mixed scores uh, on the game so far. And um, I mean, I'm on. I guess I, if if you would complain about something uh, on the game, it's because that uh, there's 
probably not kind of the overarching story among the other characters. It's more like individualizing between them. So that's probably the issue. Dantes, uh, if you want to say more before we start uh, going back and forth, uh, then yeah, yeah, just um, I don't know. Like, let, let us know what, what you think about the score so far. So 84, I think it's a pretty good score. If you guys remember, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles has the same Metacritic score. So, I mean, to me, that tells me it's fire. Again, JRPGs are not received as well as it used to be in the old days. We have to admit this. I think if uh, Persona is one of the few JRPGs that I remember getting over 90 Metacritic in the last couple of years. Um, but that said, 84, I think Kalyon has hit the nail in the coffin. The biggest complaint about the game is the fractured story. There's not like a good story, an overarching story that really takes you deep into these characters. The other piece is that the characters don't interact much, uh, which is as, as something that is bad because one thing that you love in games, again, like Xenoblade or Persona, is the interaction between all the main characters. That is not in this game. I think that was a missed opportunity. But, but positives that I keep hearing, the battle system is really unique, even though it's turn-based, it is really unique. Uh, the way you basically have to break the monsters, the destroy their armor, and then basically you knock them, uh, uh, kind of like in a stage of Street Fighter, you know what I'm saying? Like, wee, 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 and then you finally kind of be able to attack the monster with your best attacks, but you also have to decide, do you defense, save your, your points, or use those points for a big attack. So it's it's it seems to be getting a lot of positive reviews on this battle system and the artwork and the graphics. Calione is also a big winner. Everybody's really impressed how the game looks, Calione. I'm impressed how the game looks. I've seen a couple of videos, even though I haven't had a chance to play it. I've seen a couple of videos and the game is beautiful. The way they design it, Calione is top, top notch. And I'll get to something later when we talk about how uh, Octopath Traveler has sold so well, but I hope for this gives Squaresoft kind of like a view that you don't have to spend or, uh, that much money to create Final Fantasy 15 or 16. Maybe you can take it down a notch. Maybe you make it more in in in, in the middle ground, and that way you don't take like 20 years to uh, to take, have a game come out. This game was built in what in two years, probably three. I don't know something around to that extent. Uh, so that's pretty good development cycle, in my opinion. But anyway, with that, Kalyanis, anything you want to add? Because I wanted to read kind of like the top summary of the top score, the middle ground, and then, of course, the one mix. But go ahead if you want anything to add to the Metacritics. Well, I mean, uh, as far as the Metacritic, uh, you know, for some reason, when it comes to the JRPG games, uh, they didn't really score as high as, you know, the other games. Like you said, um, uh, Persona 5 seems to be the exception uh, to the rule, you know, being the only one that has scored, you know, 90 or above. Uh, but as far as uh, Octopath Traveler, I know that, you know, like people did complain about, you know, not having like an overarching story. Uh, and it's not until the very end that they, you know, start to interact uh, with one another. Uh, but is it really that bad, uh, you know, for that to be um, on a game like this? Because I think the, one of the things that they kept in mind when making this game was the, the nature of the Nintendo Switch. So the Nintendo Switch is a hybrid. You can keep, play it at home. You can take it on the go. Uh, you have eight different characters. So uh, you're not really overwhelmed with the, you know, with the game story-wise. So you can journey on one of the characters first. Um then you know, go on the next one, and and it can be if you, I mean, if you're organized and you know how to do it, you can fragment it to a point where it can become either a game that you play for a long time, or it can be a game that you sit down uh, for a quick play and play it, even though it's an art, a JRPG game. So, um, I, I mean, I believe that it's not really going to take away from the game because this, like many of the the other Nintendo games, and it's not a first party game, but. Um, Nintendo is all about the gameplay. It's all about the experience. Uh, stories, um, I mean, they have a lot of lore, um, a lot of you know, interaction. You know, to get a, a good story out of this one, of course, you need you still need to interact with the uh, NPCs and things like that. So, so you get a bigger, uh, I mean, bigger bite of you know the uh, what the story offers for you. But uh, I believe that it really doesn't take away uh, from the game because it does so many other things well. Like they say, you know, the the, the action the gameplay the fighting uh the battle system is a highlight from the game especially you know the, the graphics as well um you know it's another highlight and as far as the engine uh and i know uh, square enix they did talk about this before where they want to go back 
and bring older games to the Nintendo Switch, uh, either you know like uh, sequels of older games or uh, ports of you know uh, games that they had. Because yeah, you know, this would be perfect to use this same engine uh, for the Final Fantasy sixes, the Xeno Gears, and and all those you know the uh, Chrono Triggers and all those uh, older RPGs, so they can still enjoy the eight bit you know sixteen bit uh, you know art style, but in a way that you know it really translates to uh, newer generations of systems. So I mean, hopefully this is something that Square Enix is gonna do. And they have the perfect engine to do so. So now they don't have to worry about working on the engine. They can just concentrate on translating uh, those older games into this engine and releasing it on the system. So hopefully that happens. So I agree with what you said, Karen. The only thing I disagree is I believe that they could do a overarching story and do it well. I mean, Xenoblade Chronicles is on the Switch, and that game story, you know, that is really good. And I still feel that you can still play in bite size if you're grinding and just fighting monsters and stuff like that. So I kind of disagree there with you, but what I'm hoping is that Square Enix learns from this and they say okay so now the complaint the bigger complaint the battle system is great the graphics are great the only complaint that people seems to be having is the fragmented story maybe then we can get something in the vein you know i wouldn't mind imagine a lunar silver star story type of story caliones in this graphics when i was looking at it i was like i was like reminding me of the good old days playing lunar uh so again this, this game brings back memories and i think overarching story could be great in my opinion but i understand where you're coming from too to clarify but anyway with that calianas let me go quickly to metacritic i want to give the highest score the middle score like we always do and and the and the you know the one that didn't like it a couple of high scores digital downloaded basically gave it a 10 out of 10 says octopack traveler is a beautiful game that somehow never gets tired it is a uh uh labyrinthine plot god don't use big words with me my friend uh plot that <laughs> bravely attempts to give eight characters the same scope and development as eight sole protagonists would get in a lesser game it's it's also a game that barely makes a story all about those characters with the world harsh as it can be almost secondary to the insular unit and the individual arcs the sheer ambition is all the more impressive because Octopack Traveler uses sprites, little 2D characters made up of even little squares. <laughs> People need to play this game if only to realize that not everything spectacular needs to be photoreal. Okay, now let's, let's quickly give it uh, IGN, who gave it a 93, and was one of the first review, and I thought this game was going to get good reviews because I sent it to Kalyan, and I'm like, oh, IGN gave it a, a 9.3, so I you know I, I honestly thought that this game, this game could take over, but I mean, it, it's still favorable metacritic to clarify but ign basically said octopath traveler is a jrpg dream come through both its battle system and aesthetic pay loving tribute to the super nes era while moving the formula forward in like exciting and novel ways this isn't merely a modern retreat of past classics but a phenomenal homage which generally fresh ideas in a fantastically charming old school meets new baby while the eight different character stories could have used a little bit more connection, again, the same uh, what we've been talking uh, between them, I'm looking forward to going back to complete them all, explore many side quests, battle optional bosses, and unlock the final job classes. So, again, IGN, favorable. Not going to find a middle of the ground, like at eight. Let's see which GameSpot. GameSpot, GameSpot is a big uh, side. So, GameSpot set, gave it an eight and says... You're treated to one of the most interesting and effective reimaginings of a retro aesthetic around. Octopath will likely be a divisive game to the fractural storyline, but in one worth playing despite the, its lesser qualities. Its high points are simply too good to ignore. So again, the fractured story is the main complaint the, the game spot had. And then let's go to the bats. Uh, I'll mix. Let me say mix because we haven't had bad. It's just mix. And I'm gonna uh, give it to RPG side. RPG side is being in the in the web uh, world for a uh, while wow, since I was in college. Uh, so you know, and they they always been reviewing RPGs for so many years, over twenty so years. Uh, so Kalianas, uh, this is interesting. This is gonna be interesting and see how how they give it. But basically said, uh, I really want to love Octopath Traveler. But the messy nature of his story presentation is ultimately an enormous weakness. 
that stands out, but this game is only uh, is also truly one of the most intriguing evolutions of the golden age of RPGs formula out of Japan, managing to both build on the build on and play homage to the classics. So again, and maybe so for JRPG fans who like storytelling, who like overarching arcs, could see could could see a struggle with this game. But again, battle system graphics push through with this game. Anyway, that's kind of like an, a nice overview of the Metacritic. Anything to add, Kalianos, before we move on to the next uh, hot topic? Well, um, I think one of the uh, the the perfect ways yeah, you know, that somebody summarized the game uh, on on Twitter was saying basically that. This is the right step, or this is the uh, the the current generation step of what an RP a JRPG would be like if Final Fantasy VII would have never happened. So yeah, so I mean, so yeah, if you go from all the games that have released up until the uh, the Final Fantasy VI, uh, Colonel Triggers, and those, this looks like the uh, I mean the right evolution of those type of games. So you know, then you went over to the Final Fantasy VII, and then that's when it, they went into the 3D. And and started developing over on that that end, but yeah, I mean uh, the aesthetics and everything, uh, it is top notch. I am not, uh, I mean I'm against the people that say, oh, because it's it's a sprite game, uh, it should be you know less than sixty dollars. You know the, the game doesn't deserve to be sixty dollars because the graphics look like you know the uh, the older Super NES era type games. You know that's and that you know makes no sense. Uh, this is a game that you're probably going to play for over 100 hours if you try to do everything. So, I mean, the um, the production value is there. The re- replayability is on there as well. And, yeah, the quality, yes, it does have uh, currently, uh, you know, it's not a, a 90 on Metacritic. It is an 84, but for a JRPG and one like this one where pretty much almost everybody is in consensus that the experience is great, the story and how it's delivered may be divisive, so that's going to be what makes or break for certain people uh, the experience of this game. Okay. Uh, we shall see. I mean, it's off to a good start. We have another news to tackle. We'll leave it for later, but it's off to a good start, and I'm happy to see this type of games. And I agree 100%. Uh, the value of the game, it's not on the graphics. The value of the game is how you see the value. I mean, if you feel that this game is $30, $40 to you because of the graphics, all power f- to you. If you think that this game has a lot of hours of gameplay and deserves the $60, which I agree, uh, then uh, that's the value to you. Because, I mean, we pay for AAA games sometimes $60 for campaigns of 8 and 10 hours. So uh, this game is it's a lot to offer. But anyway, Caliones, with that said, let's move to the next hot topic. So what's going on, my friend? Well, the uh, next piece of news is going to be something that I, I want to get your input on this one because uh, it's uh, it has to do with something that you said earlier, um, and mainly because you said that oh, um, you know, Nintendo they released two games on the same day with you know uh, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker and Octopath Traveler uh, instead of maybe you know spacing them out. Uh, so the next piece of news, and this is another one that. Uh, I want to know, like, okay, so Nintendo stated that they want to release in between 20 to 30 indie titles games every week on the Nintendo Switch. And the question is, is this good? Is this bad? What do you think of this, Dantes? It's bad. In my opinion, it's bad. But to clarify, and Carolina knows, I've been harping on this for years on Steam, for years on the place PSN. And I'm going to harp on it on the on the eShop now if it starts to become this way because then you get a lot of crap, a lot of shovelware, a lot of indie crap that is going to get you drowned. The reason the games, Nintendo, you have to understand this, more is not better. The reason some of the games, some indie games like Golf Story are selling so well in your system is because there's not that much competition. There's breeding room. There's something to show those indies. You know, uh, Hollow Knight, bring quality games like Hollow Knight, Celeste, Golf Story. Those are the indie games that you need to ta- target, not a number to say, I want 20 to 30 indie games. Because what's going to happen is that you're going to get your own Black Tiger. And then don't don't let me don't, don't say that I didn't warn you when you get a Black Tiger on your on your on your indie store. So just asking Nintendo to me, this is bad. Take it back. 
Just make sure. I think that what you need to do is make sure that you get the good, the good uh, indie games. That's what you need to target, not the amount. Go ahead, Kalian. Well, okay, so uh, you, you got to do the math on this. Okay, so how many on a year? How many weeks? 52, 52 right? 52. Okay, and if you release 20 to 30, uh, I mean, 20 to 30 titles a week, how many, how many is that going to be? I don't know. Do the math. Three times uh, 52. 30 okay, times 52. so 30 times 52. So that's going to be, okay, I mean, I just want to do it on here just to be sure, but that makes it 1,560 games a year. So do you think it's smart to release 1,560 games a year for a single system? No. No, it's not. I just too much. Like I said, and, I Steam, yeah, and, Steam is pure crap right now because of this. But anyway, go ahead. And, and to put it in perspective, okay, so for example, the, uh, the Super Nintendo, uh, there were a total of... Um, 1,757 games released on the system, uh, but you know there was you know, space like you know like 721 in North America, 517 in Europe, 1,447 in Japan. Then you go to the Nintendo 64. It had 196 releases in Japan, 296 in North America, and 242 in Europe. And you go to the Wii, and the Wii, which is the one that everybody was complaining about shovelware on the system, and because of you know so many games that were I mean, some of them were crappy games. Um, it had 1,528 games released among all the regions. So if people are complaining about shovelware on the Wii, and it has 1,528 games, can you imagine releasing that same amount on a single year of the Nintendo Switch? Like, I mean, that's going to be, one, it's way too many games, two, they they're not curating the 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 eShop well enough for them to be able to have those many games and be able to yeah you know, put it in categories where people are gonna find them. At some point, there's gonna be games that they're gonna be completely lost unless they go on a sale or or something like that. But that's yeah, to me, uh, I know that they've been doing close to 15 to 20 games a week uh, some of the times. But if they go all the way to you know 20 to 30, uh, that's that's way too much. We're going to have to stop doing the supermarket segment if they go between 20 and 30 uh, games <laughs> a week, Calionis. We wouldn't be able. And then we would be saying a lot of games that we don't even know what they are, which again is what happens with Steam and the PSN. You have to be careful, Nintendo. But anyway, we both agree. Hopefully, Nintendo will stop this foolishness and just concentrate on the good games like Hollow Knight. Like Shovel Knight, you know, like Golf Story, like uh, Undertale, which coming to the Switch, you know, good indie games. That's what you need to target. Don't, don't, you're going to get your Black Tiger. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. You don't yeah, want we're, that. <laughs> and we're going to, we're going to start getting uh, developers like Digital Homicide, just making any sort of games with any sort of assets, throwing it together, putting it on the mar market and see if somebody's stupid enough to buy them. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you, if you curate the games, if you make sure that you have, you know, the the good quality games. I mean, they should probably just go back to to the seal of quality approval from Nintendo, like they used to have in the old days. I mean, maybe something like that, you know, should be good for them to uh, to do it, especially for games that they're going to be just going straight to the eShop and you don't have demos or things like that. But um, yeah, they they need to curate it. They need to make sure that what goes in there is going to be quality, and that's also going to push developers to make sure that they release quality games because if they're quality, you know, quality, they will sell. You know, they're going to find a way to sell. That is correct, Caliones. Uh, I guess we both agree. So let's move on to the next hot topic. Okay, and on the next one, and this is one that, you know, had me worried. I have two Nintendo Switch units, and after I read the news, I quickly went over to them. I checked them, and it's it seems like a lot of people are, well, I mean, I'm not going to say a lot, but we're starting to receive, you know, quite a few reports of people reporting that they have cracked Nintendo Switch consoles. And, you know, some of those cracks, you know, they seem to emanate from the portion where you have the vents on the top of the unit. Um, they are saying that, you know, it seems like it's not because of a defect on the plastic or anything like that. It's because when they screwed the unit, they screwed it uh, too hard. And that's probably what's causing the breakage, but... <laughs> 
Sorry. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I should have known. Walked into that one. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's something that sh- is this something that we need to worry about than this. So I I looked at mine too. I got two here, two units in my house. I didn't sell anything, so that's good. Uh, but I think that's something that Nintendo needs to look into. I think it's all about heat. So I would recommend you trying to find solutions to eliminate heat when you're docking. So let's make sh- I want to see if there's any other solutions for for ventilation calliones out there so we can unite to the dock and maybe that gives a little bit of more uh you know uh fan uh through the system and that should reduce the chances of cracking. So I would recommend people trying to see if they can find at the same time this could be a small portion calliones we're not sure. Maybe some of the plastics that they put on those systems are, are, you know, are weaker than others on lower end of the spec. Trust me, being in the, in the manufacturing business, you'll get some something in production that you'll be in the lower spec, and that could be happening here. At the same time, uh, don't send it to Nintendo to fix. Go in YouTube, try to buy the back plate, and you can buy it, fix it yourself here or using it in other means. Nintendo is charging two hundred dollars for fixing it, which is I don't I don't get it yet, but it's two ways. Some people say Nintendo is, is being anti-consumer because they're not really taking this seriously. Understandable, you're in that point and you're you're more than than you know you're more to, to think that. And I'm in the middle ground. Let me explain. I believe that Nintendo should be looking these in depth, but me being working in the farm in, in the in the manufacturing business says pharmaceutical in the ph- pharma <laughs> manufacturing business when you get complaints you have to investigate first find the root cause first right nintendo doesn't have enough data at this time to say it's an issue or not so they're probably investigating the issue first before they determine the best path forward now if you want to talk about slime ball and you should look at Xbox because when they when the red re- ring of dead was happening, they knew that it was happening. They sent the system out to the market knowing on the defect, and they were saying that that was not the case, that that is impossible until they had to admit it and they spend a lot of money replacing consoles because of their decision, right? So I'm gonna give Nintendo a pass until Nintendo does the 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 investigation. Hopefully, it's not that they knew about the weakness. It's just that they're learning about it. You know, engineering is tough. Sometimes you engineer and you don't see the issue until later. Uh, and then uh, this is what could possibly happen. The only thing that I would recommend, if you get a crack, try to fix it yourself. Don't spend the $200. Uh, and B, if you don't have a crack and you are concerned about it, I would recommend trying to put your dog in an area that gets a lot of air gone through or trying to find other means of providing ventilation through the system. Anything to add, Carlos? Well, and you also have to understand, like, now is the time where Nintendo it's getting ready for the fall and the winter time, which is, you know, like gearing up for the holidays. So they're trying to amass as many Nintendo Switch units as they can. Uh, they're trying to put them together. And they, well, I guess, yeah, they can't really, well, they may or may not be able to afford uh, using those consoles in exchange for others when they should be you know sending them over to retailers and having them ready for for the you know christmas season so like you said they may be wanting to assess how many people this is happening to uh and see if it's something that if it's a small portion and they should just go ahead and you know replace a console and give them another one or if they have to set up something so they can start doing the repairs on, on them so so that's something that there's I would say, I mean, I'm not, I don't work for Nintendo, but I'm pretty sure, like you said, they're still evaluating, they're still finding out and seeing how big, and I mean, how big is this is happening? If it's something where it, it was only a small batch for a specific country, if it's happening worldwide, uh, you know, the footprint of, of how big this is. So Nintendo still assessing, and I still, I still believe at the end of the day, if it's a manufactured uh, you know, defect, then they should uh, replace it for the consumer. Maybe, like you said, maybe they can go ahead and, and send the back plate and send the uh, this you know the the screwdrivers for you know the the consumer so they can go ahead and replace them themselves. Maybe that's something that they could do, and that probably would be a cheaper than uh, exchanging one console for another. So, I mean, we, Nintendo hasn't really commented officially on this. Uh, hopefully, they will soon. So, for those of you that have this issue, you know uh, what they're going to be doing yeah you know, to assist you. But um, 
uh, as, you know, at the same time, hopefully it's not something widespread and it's with a small group of people or, or consoles uh, that this is happening to. We shall see. We shall see. For now, in my case, I'm in the middle ground. I'm not calling out Nintendo yet, but you know me. I'll call whoever. If Nintendo takes too long on this and they didn't discover it's an issue, we'll call out Nintendo. If it's just a minor pool of people who's having this issue, then, uh, you know, hey, tough luck. No no hardware is perfect, trust me. Yeah. Yeah. And this is coming from someone who has replaced one fat PS3. We had to get a second fat PS3 because I didn't want to lose my original fat PS3. Uh I have replaced uh, Wii, U, uh, Wii, the original Wii. I ha I went through one into warranty. I had to get another one. A GameCube, too. I had to replace one GameCube, too. Uh, PlayStation 2 died on me. It died, uh, uh, and I believe that was because of heat. Uh, but it died, and I had to wait until PlayStation 3, basically, to get back my PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 1. Uh, so and no system is perfect. But we shall see. We shall see, Calionis. Hopefully, Nintendo will do right to the customer, which is what matters. Uh, Calionis, let's go to the next one. Okay, going over to the next piece of news, and this is, comes from the uh, uh, Matt uh, Piscatella from the MPD. Uh, he stated that the Switch will be the best-selling console of the fourth quarter in the United States and the best-selling console of 2018. Uh, so uh, as far as I, I believe right now, if people were to count the other console sales, I believe the PS4 is still ahead of the Nintendo Switch when it comes to the uh, the overall sales uh, for the year. Yep. But they're saying that you know they believe that by the end of the year, Switch will be the best-selling console as well as you know, in the fourth quarter in the U.S. So so they need to, uh, I guess, get a, pri a pretty sizable lead when it comes to the fourth quarter. I don't think Nintendo's going to do any, um, I mean, they're not going to do any uh, discounts on the console. But I did see something, I believe it, it was on Best Buy, where they had uh, the console for $329.99. And you had your choice of you know, Splatoon, uh, Legend of Zelda, uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, or, or any Switch game. So, so any Switch game that was $60, basically you will get it uh, for $30. Or you can say... You get the full game, you know, for the full price, and you get the, the console uh, with a thirty dollars discount. So, so maybe that's something that we will be seeing. Hopefully, um, I mean, if they really want to sell those twenty million units by the end of fiscal year twenty eighteen, uh, they they have to, I mean, push the pedal to the metal. I'm not sure if they're on track so far, but of course, you know, they have you know Pokemon Let's Go and Smash uh, in the holidays, so that's going to be a really big push that they're going to receive. But uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think Switch will eventually make it as the best-selling console of 2018? It should. I think the question is how much elite Sony can build because Sony has been winning all the MPDs in the last couple of months because of, you know, big games like God of War, Detroit Become Human. It, it is what it is. Sony has the exclusives right now. They're selling more. Last year, during this time, Nintendo had the exclusives like Zelda Breath of the Wild, and then it was it was selling a lot of consoles, right? Uh, Splatoon 2, of course, and stuff like that. Uh, and then, of course, Sony still has Spider-Man to come up in September. So it depends how big Spider-Man can create that lead. Uh, and if Spider-Man is it's a big game like everybody expects. I'm really tempered with Spider-Man. I know it's going to be a big game. And I know it's going to move consoles. But I don't know if it's going to do it like a lot of people expect. But we shall see. Now, with that said, if Sony cannot build enough of a lead, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and, and, and Eevee could be big enough to at least cut on the lead, if not take over. So basically the MPD analyst is just saying, look, Nintendo in the fourth quarter of this year has some big games coming up. They see the lead not being that big at that time for PlayStation. So they expect that Nintendo will be selling the most overall during 2018 because of the fourth quarter. Can they do it? Yeah, I think they can do it. It just depends if the Switch becomes another hot item in December like it did last year, right? And it's, it's all about trends sometimes, Calionis. Is, it, is the hype still there? Because last year, the, the Switch was new. Everybody wanted the Switch. Is that hype going to stay? Is Smash going to be enough, right? I do not know that. So I cannot say, oh, yeah, Nintendo is going to win. I'm going to say, though, that they have a damn good shot of doing it because of the games that they have come in the fourth quarter. Yeah, and, and to be more specific uh, about why he makes these comments, uh, I'm just going to quote uh, what he said. He said, uh, the Nintendo Switch has the second highest time online install base for a console in history, 
trailing only the Wii to this point. Um, and he also said that driven by the launches of Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, Pokemon Let's Go Eevee, and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the Nintendo Switch will be the best-selling console of the fourth quarter in unit sales, while also elevating the platform to be the best-selling console of the year. So um, I know that, you know, when uh, like you said, um, the PS4 already had two of the, the biggest you know, launches uh, for them, which is, you know, God of War, uh, Detroit Become Human. Uh, Spider-Man should be a big one as well. Uh, like you said, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm also not sure if it's going to be moving enough consoles or if it's going to be pretty much the, the, the install base that they have already that's going to be picking it up. So, um, And after, um, after that one, then they have to rely on third-party games. Uh, that's going to be what's going to push after you know, uh, you know September, October, November, uh, what's going to be pushing the PS4. Uh, I believe uh, Japan just announced uh, once again, that they're going to be releasing a Monster Hunter World bundle uh, PS4. So that's so, it's going to be something that should help uh, you know sell uh, as well. Even though uh, some analysts were complaining about you know, Monster Hunter World not having enough legs, uh, even though it's the best Capcom game ever. So I don't know you know what what they're complaining so, about. So uh, I kind of um, to intervene. Very yeah. jammy saying that uh, she predicts that the the Switch will sell outsell PlayStation in Japan by. 2019 end of 2019 ps4 we all sell the wii lifetime as well uh, yeah i mean in japan there's no denying that who, who's gonna take that that crown it's, it's uh, like, a, like, a, like a set in stone i mean in, in two years i think the switch is already halfway of the ps4 lifetimes in japan compared to ps4 being available for four to five years anyway i just wanted to intervene one of that comment since uh, person was kind of uh, talking about our subject so great if you guys again if you guys want to have some questions anything in the chat please let us know but go ahead Calens. yeah and i mean just just uh to the point um you know we've already glossed over it, over it anyway so so yeah I, I also believe that that's going to be the case because i mean we know you know pokemon and smash those are brands that have been around for years and they have are known to sell a lot of consoles and of course, you know the, the Pokemon Let's Go. You have two different versions of the game. Uh, there's going to be people that are going, you know, going to buy both you know, versions of it. But there's people that have been waiting to get a Nintendo Switch for those games, and and that's the reason why I think it's going to pick up uh, because they they have such a dedicated install base that you know you have people that they don't really care about anything except for Pokemon, or they don't really care about anything else except for Smash. And you yeah, know, there's, a, there's a lot of, of those yeah. God in the comment search. Yeah, like <laughs> Breath of the Wild is not gonna sell on the system. Super Mario uh, Odyssey is not gonna sell on the system, nor is Platoon Two or Xenoblade Chronicles Two, but those games specifically. So, so we're we're gonna see a pretty good big uptick. I'm really interested to see how it's gonna do here in Europe and in, in the U.S. Uh, and I believe it's probably gonna hit number one on all three regions. Uh, at the same time with those games come out. Maybe. I'm only going to add one thing. Calionis, you have to remember, PS4 is coming to the end of the cycle, and you don't know the type of uh, bargains that they're going to have during Christmas time. PlayStation every Christmas sells a lot because of the good offers that they have now that they're on the end of the cycle of the PlayStation 4. Will Nintendo, if those two games are enough to sell without the hype of last year, that's the biggest question because Nintendo is not going to lower the price. So is PlayStation going to have a new price for the Pro and the PS and the vanilla PS4? That remember last year it, it helped them take one of the Christmas time months, November or December. I don't remember because they had great offers, right? And 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 that's going to be the biggest question mark: is those two games enough, or is the bargain prices or the offers that Sony is going to give for their console it's going to be enough themselves to take over? But I believe yeah. it's going to be in between. Yeah. PlayStation and Nintendo, honestly, who's gonna win the holiday season? So. Yeah, and I and I believe, um, I mean, I think it's you know Sony is getting close to when I personally believe they're gonna be announcing the PS4 Pro as the base console when it comes to the uh, the PlayStation family, and they're gonna you know start kind of like pushing out the uh, the PlayStation 4 uh, and Slim. So so I think that's probably gonna come soon. Um, so I believe, like you said, yes, uh, they're going to have pretty good bargains. And I know, you know, last year Nintendo Switch had no sales, but Nintendo, you know, still won uh, the the you know the 
uh, the Black Friday uh, weekend, and they won the, the Cyber Monday as well uh, without having any sales. So hopefully they can do something this year, um, you know, so to entice the fans or entice the people that still haven't purchased it, and that Smash and Pokemon may not be enough, but you know, some sort of thing count would go a long way uh, into people you know deciding to get it, even if it's you know twenty bucks. For you know, some people, twenty bucks makes a big difference. So, uh, and it's all about perception as well. So, uh, we'll, we'll see what Nintendo does, but I think they are on track to uh, to do what the analyst said. Okay, we shall see. It's going to be interesting this December. Uh, with that, Carlos, that was the last hot topic, correct? <laughs> okay, yeah, because we're forty minutes in. Good topics today, hot topic, because it's time to kind of it's time to move, move to Onuma's. News burst. And <laughs> what is the first piece of news in news burst today, Caliona? Well, the first piece of news, and it's one that I'm, I got mixed feelings on, is that Square Enix apologizes for Octopath Traveler supply shortage in Japan. Uh, why is it you know bittersweet for me? Bitter because they ran out of copies, you know, for people to purchase. Sweet because they ran out of copies for people to purchase. So, you know, for me, this is, um, I mean, hopefully they didn't anticipate too, you know, too few, uh, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, copies being sold. Um, and it's because they had so many people purchase the game that it's been uh, over, I mean, going over their expectations when it comes to, you know, the sales on the system. So I don't know, like, how, how do you feel about this, Dante? So quickly, it's news burst, right? So I'll say this, and this is what I wanted to finish this with, is uh, two things. Hopefully this makes Square Enix finally understand that you don't have to make a billion-dollar game. You don't have to take 20 years to get Final Fantasy VII Remake out. You can make a good game with this type of graphics and make good money. That's one. Two, I do not blame Square for not having enough supply, and this is my reasoning for it. In the last couple of years, JRPGs are not selling in Japan even though the genre has a J on the damn uh, name, right? JRPG, Japanese RPGs. They are not selling. Unless you're Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest, Kalionis, they're not selling like they used to. Just weird, quirky games like Splatoon are the stuff that is selling right now. And I can put you examples. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 sold way more in the West, right? Um, uh, Nino Kuni 2. So way more in the West. Persona, so way more in the West. Near Automata, so way more in the West. The West is embracing the Japanese game more than the East. And that's where Square said, oh, typical JRPG is going to be sell. And they maybe use other old games. They could have used I Am Setsuna and, and, and Lost Fear as a gauge of, oh, they're going to sell this many copies for old school RPGs. So we're going to send this many. And they got surprised that a lot of people are, are liking the game and buying it. And, you know, it is what it is. So I don't blame Square stuff. I'm happy that it's selling well. I'm happy that maybe J J Japanese gamers are back to playing some JRPGs. And at the same time, I'm hopeful it sends a message to Square Enix. Yeah, and, it, and it's also going to depend on uh, on the you know the type of legs that the game has. It seems like you know the game uh, is going to be a mix of one, it is a Nintendo Switch exclusive. Two, uh, it is a throwback to a generation where you know people like you, like me, love, uh, and we kind of miss you know those, those you know type of games. Three, the production value, even though it's like a, I mean you can say like a 16-bit type game or the aesthetics, uh, the production value is amazing uh, for it. And uh, lastly, I don't know, like uh, it is uh, kind of like a, it's a different type of game that you have on the system, even, even though uh, it is a JRPG, but these type of JRPGs, they're not really common anymore. So I'm glad that they're you know, still tackling uh, this type of era and that they uh, hopefully will continue to do so. So, so I believe it will uh, sell well, but hopefully it will continue to carry, you know, to have pretty good legs. So it continues uh, and gives uh, Square Enix the indication that they should continue making more of them. Yep, we shall see. Go ahead, Karen, with the next one. Okay, so on the next one, um, it's basically uh, Ubisoft producer uh, Matthew Rose. Uh, he was talking about how Reggie Fistame influenced the addition of Star Fox characters to the Starlink Battle for Atlas game. 
And he said that uh, during a small scale, a small scale closed doors demo event last year, Reggie was present and happened to see the game. Reggie was the one who noticed the possibilities the game could bring and invited the Starlink developers to present the game to Miyamoto and the Star Fox development team. This was what led to the collaboration. So, uh, yeah, they saw the type of game. Uh, yeah, Reggie was able to see that, you know, the Star Fox could be implemented into it. They already have a really good relationship with Ubisoft uh, because of, you know, how Mario Rabbids Kingdom Battle turned out. And they saw this as another opportunity uh, to have a collaboration. And of course, yeah, Ubisoft jumped on it. Uh, the Star Fox team, including Miyamoto, saw it, and they were uh, on board as well. And that's where why we're seeing it. So hopefully, uh, we will see more stuff like that. Uh, any any other ones that you want to see, Dantes? Uh, like I've been saying, just give dormant IPs to developers who could do something with it, like it, kick it, Icarus and F Zero stuff that you're not doing right now, Nintendo and. Collaborations like this are great. Uh, only thing I'm going to say about Reggie, though, is, I mean, this is good. A good win for Reggie. I'm still a little bit salty for Operational Rainfall many, many years ago. Uh, he still hasn't uh, fixed it in my eyes. But at least this helps Nintendo America is becoming better after the mistakes that they made on the Wii. Thinking that casuals were the future and they were pushing a lot of shovelware and crap. But hardcore gamers, it is where it is. And Octopack Traveler is a perfect example of that. Xenoblade became a franchise for them. So uh, hopefully this is a lesson learned. And maybe that's, what, that's what's happening. Reggie saw the possibilities. Star Fox is a big IP. They could take advantage. And maybe this will lead at some point to Ubisoft developing a brand new Star Fox game. So. Well, uh, going over with the next piece of news is that the Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PC... Uh, will be supporting cross-party play soon on Rocket League. So, you know, the, the game does already support uh, cross-play, but uh, one of the you know, issues they were having is, uh, you know, trying to find a solution how they can have uh, people partying up uh, on, on matches outside of private matches. And they, you know, went ahead and implemented the, uh, the Rocket ID, which is something that uh, they will be launching soon. This kind of works a little bit like, uh, you know, you having an Epic account yeah. in Fortnite. Yeah, so... So it works, uh, you know, pretty much the same way, and this is a solution that that way you can, um, you know, um, I mean, just basically sign up, uh, get the ID, uh, register your platform, and just have everybody, you know, party up and play together. So you know, just uh, glad that they're doing it. And um, I wanted to add uh, because I'm not sure that this is something that uh, we have on here, but it's that Nintendo stated that they are willing uh, to help developers. Uh, you know, have crossplay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Nintendo said that they're willing to help developers uh, get crossplay working on their games. So they're very willing, of course. Uh, you know how you say usually whenever uh, you're not you know, the number one in the market, you get creative on finding certain ways to be able to sell your games on your system. But and, you know, to me, this is a great way to you know for Nintendo themselves to help themselves. But also, it, it helps greatly. Xbox One, it helps PC, and it helps games uh, have a longer uh, life because you still have a big pool of people playing it instead of just being marginalized to one single system. So, I mean, I mean I'm glad that you know they're working on that on Rocket League, and hopefully, uh, we'll continue with other games. Agreed. Nothing to say, Nintendo. You have to take advantage of things like goodwill right now that you have for crossplay. They're just taking advantage of it. Nothing wrong with that. Any company should take advantages or the positives that you have as a company. So, Yeah, and we have uh, Barry uh, Jammy stating on the chat that he's saying that Sony can only uh, resist crossplay for so long. Uh, PS4 sales are slowing down while both Switch and Xbox accelerate. Uh, so, yeah, so I'll say, like, I mean, to, to some extent, yes, it is true. Uh, I mean, you're still going to go to the PS4 when it comes to first-party games, but there might be certain games, like Fortnite, for example, where people are going to be playing it on the Switch and the Xbox instead of going and, you know, and getting a PS4 for it because that's where you're going to be able to have all your friends and family members and, and other people. So, I mean, it's I don't know how much it's going to be affecting uh, the, play, the PlayStation, but it is going to affect us somewhat if they don't jump uh, in and implement crossplay, so I mean, either way, like you know that they're you know they're for the players. So hopefully, this is something that they will do. I know that in a way, it benefits them not doing it because they're 
forcing play people to buy a PlayStation, and that's a sale that they get. But at the end of the day, I mean, just to make it easier for everybody and and to have everybody uh, being able to play with one another, um, you know, hopefully they get to implement it uh, soon enough. So two two pieces. So I do not agree that the sales of the PlayStation Four has been slowing down as console wise. Is that they still the number one selling console the last couple of months? We shall see if the next coming months it does hurt. I do agree. If you if 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 we're talking about software sales of some games that have crossplay with other consoles, right, Calionis? Then yes, then I could see that on games that people start spending money with Xbox and Nintendo in those games like Fortnite or Rocket League and stuff like that. That could hurt Sony, but console-wise, it's been fine, and that's where Sony, until Sony sees a deep dip in their soft hardware sales, they're not gonna do anything. But but the pressure has been there. Sony will come up with something, I believe. If it's not this generation, at least in the PS5, PS5 generation, they have to come out because Microsoft. I'm telling you, Microsoft on the on the reveal of the next Xbox, they're gonna come out with all the positives that they have. And PlayStation needs to be careful because bad messaging, you can see how it affected the Xbox One, could hurt the start of PlayStation 5 like bad messaging hurt the start of PlayStation 3. Yeah, but I, I think they can probably spin this into a positive because uh, you know Sony can easily come out next E3, announce the PS5, and say... Uh, not only are we going to have cross-play uh, with Xbox and Nintendo when it comes to uh, you know our third-party games, but we are also going to have backwards compatibility with the PS4, PS3, PS2, PS1, and all that. So, so th those are two big negatives on the PS4 currently. But if they say something like that at E3 for a PS5, that's those are going to be big news. That I mean, of course, is going to is going to help them out. Uh, you know, when it comes to having a good push for for the PS5 launch. They'll, they'll figure something out. I think, remember, it's two things. And people keep forgetting about crossplay. It's two things. It's playing with other people, yes. But it's buying the items through the system, through through Sony. Sony, what they could do is you crossplay is available, but your account maybe is still a, bit, a little bit hostage in the sense that you cannot take your account somewhere else because they want those sales for the the items that you buy through. That's what they want. Sony, they hope, Sony's not against. You guys have to remember. Sony has the most cross-play games of any console. People forget that because they cross-play with PC consistently. The problem is not cross-play. The problem is getting your account through and using it somewhere else. That's that's the problem. Trust me. It's all about the money, Kaliana. So we shall see how Sony comes out and works out. But this almost became a hot topic. But thank you, Barry Jeremy, for uh, bringing that uh, to the equation. Let's go to the next uh, uh, news. Okay, so uh, we have uh, you know Daisuke Sato uh, saying that he doesn't think that the Yakuza series is a good fit uh, for the Nintendo Switch, uh, and yeah, you know, this is um, I mean like they they were asking him. Uh, he was talking to um, um, yeah, this was a public uh, or published uh, with Game Blog, and the question was that you know Ryo Ga Gotoku One and Two HD is released on the Wii U. Binary Domain is released on the Xbox 360. Why not take out the Yakuza on Switch and Xbox One to further enlarge the base of fans uh, of the series in the West? So his response to it, to this was that, yeah, to be realistic about what happened, Ryoga Gotoku 1 and 2 HD for Wii U was a major failure. But we always have the optics to develop multi-platform games as much as possible, and we know that it brings an additional audience that it, and that it allows to drain more people. On the other hand, as far as the Switch is concerned, I'm convinced that this is not the platform on which to develop Yakuza games uh, would be ideal. Maybe the public does not expect this kind of game on Switch. Maybe they are used to a different to different games. This may not be the ideal part platform regarding the Xbox One. We can possibly consider it, knowing Xbox One users may be more likely to be interested in a game like Yakuza. This could potentially be an option. So, um, I mean, the only thing that I have with this comment um, that he said is, uh, you know, judging uh, the, you know, real Gagotoku 1 and 2 uh, games on the Wii U and, and being failures because, I mean, pretty much anything and everything except for first party games on the Wii U were failures. Uh, I mean, that goes to, you know, pretty much every, every single third party game that came out on the system. So, uh, I mean, don't gauge 
uh, a system, I mean, the, the sales on a system that only had a little over 13 million consoles sold uh, worldwide. Um, but uh, at the same time, I think Yakuza is a game series well enough known that it can do well on any system. I think, uh, I mean, if, if it goes on the Switch, it will do well. If it get, go, you know, comes out on the Xbox One, I think it's gonna do uh, pretty well as well. But, but it, I mean, not 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 close to the PS4 numbers, but it's still it's still gonna sell well. Um, what I, what I do feel like is if they produce the current gen uh, Yakuza games, then yes, they're gonna have to kind of like a, take a little step backwards to optimize it for the Switch, and that's something that he may not be wanting to do. Uh, but I personally believe that on, on the Switch, uh, the game would sell uh, pretty good. Uh, I think better than the Xbox One. Maybe not as close as the PlayStation, but I think it, it would sell uh, pretty good for them to call it a success. Okay. So I'm going to say this, though. You know, I know that it, everybody knows Jakusa and all the fans, Sony fans, call it, oh, another PlayStation exclusive. Like Jakusa has always been exclusive. But in reality, Jakusa is a third-party game that has been exclusive for Sony for so long. Is it a case, Calionis, that sell that Sega is not wanting to take the risk to increase the fan base because they're happy with the fan base that they have and they're making enough money? And what I mean with that, developing other consoles means more money. It's going to cost you more money. So then you have to gauge your parameters and say, am I going to make enough money for me to spend this money to port these games over to the switch and xbox that is the biggest question that sega has and maybe sega is happy but in life if you don't take risk you don't know how far it could go i believe that at least a switch version at least should be tried they have been putting the yakuza's remaster games on the playstation 4 the last couple yakuza 0 yakuza 1 has come out start there start with yakuza 0 like i don't get into the franchise to tell you the truth because it's all already on yakuza 6 or 7 I, I just don't have time to go back and start with zero and one and two and three and four and five. But a lot of people on the Switch, they're hungry for games because it's a new console. They like the portability. Yakuza is a game that has a lot of grinding on it, Calionis. So why not have it portable so it could be uh, it could have a chance to, you could do the, the off, off tasks of grinding and stuff like that on the Switch portable. You don't know. But at the same time, if Sega is not willing to take the risk, that's on them, Calionis. Uh, this so just sounded like an old Wii U excuse, why games wouldn't come to the Wii U, and Yakuza games are also not that powerful games that they cannot run on the Switch, honestly. So, it's just an excuse, but it is more, to clarify, you have to read between the lines of these people. It is all about optics. It's Sega guys asking themselves, do we have enough uh, of, uh, of, of people in the Switch worthwhile to spend the money developing a port, right? That it, it, it makes sense for the investment. That is the question that they're having, and they're not sure yet. I don't know why not. Switch is doing well, but it is what it is. Maybe maybe they're just waiting for Nintendo to do the same thing that they did with Skyrim, Doom, Wolfenstein, and it's for Nintendo to come out, come over to them and say, hey, if you make the game for the Switch, uh, we'll go ahead and, be, and publish it. So that way we can assume some of the risk uh, if the game doesn't sell as good. Yes, and that by unit as well. Yeah, no, uh, maybe. Yeah, Sega, Sega is not. Trust me, Sega is not the Sega of all. They they need to be careful on their investments. That is it. That's where they are. So anyway, let's go with the next one, Kalyan. Okay, and going over to with the next piece of news, and this is uh, talking about uh, you know just uh, the Nintendo Switch. Basically, between all the regions, the Switch now has over nine hundred games that are available to play. So, you know, the, the system has been out for kind of like a year and a half already. Uh, it has 900 games. And then going back to the other piece of news, and it, I mean, with it getting close to 1,000 games uh, out on the system, and they want to release 20 to 30 more each week now, uh, I think that's, um, you know, the 900 games, that's amazing. That's great for the system. But um, I think they should pace themselves uh, a little when, when it comes to Quality what they... over quantity. Out of the 900 games, maybe... 50 are good, Calionis. See, that's that's what I'm saying. Quantity over quality. It doesn't matter. Make sure that you get the good games, the great games. That's what you Nintendo needs to worry about. Okay, going over with the next piece of news, and this is um, Bill Trinan. Uh, he stated that uh, when it comes to more Super Smash Bros. Ultimate character reveals, 
that we can answer that when we get closer to December. Uh, so it seems, you know, like one of the other uh, rumors that they were running is that even though you had the the 1,000 hour reveal of Smash doing E3, uh, I mean, there were still some characters that were being kept uh, from, you know, from being announced uh, during that time that there would probably be maybe like, you know, six more characters. Uh, and so far, um, they, I mean, they've, kept you know most of them you know close to the chest uh they haven't really said anything of what other characters uh, will be coming out uh and you would figure that maybe i mean like something that was really successful back back on the uh, on the wii u and this is something that you mentioned as well uh every couple of weeks you had uh one of those oh you know this new smash uh, bros character uh coming to you know coming to the you know the, the wii u game then a, a week or two later another character reveal of another one of those coming and they would do it every you know, week, every couple of weeks, and this built momentum for the release of the game. I know that, you know, pretty much for this one, it doesn't really need too much momentum built uh, because, because people are going to buy it. It's going to outsell the, the Wii U version, even though they, you know, they're different games. It's not a port. But um, I don't know, like, do you see too many characters being announced uh, by, uh, the, you know, the game's launch? Or are we pretty much set on what characters will be available? Mm, I think there could be a couple of surprises. I'm kind of still hoping Rex and Mithra is there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard, Kalinas, because they're putting every character in this mash. How can you balance that many characters is one of the questions we're going to have uh, when that Smash Bros. releases. So, we shall see. But I'm hopeful there's still a couple of surprises, Kalinas. I think, like you stated, it did help. It helped Smash on the Wii U. Uh, kept that hype going. We shall see if uh, they have a couple more to go. Okay, uh, continuing with the next piece of news, uh, and this is something that it's I don't know, like it, it's. I, I'm just gonna say the news, uh, and then I'll say what I think about this. I really want to hear about you as well. Uh, Take Two confirms that WWE 2K19 is not coming to the Nintendo Switch. Uh, it's only going to be made for PC, PlayStation, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. Uh, and in regards to the matter, they stated that the game will not be available on Nintendo Switch. 2K is focused on making the best possible experience for WWE 2K fans and will continue evaluating all opportunities to deliver the franchise across across additional platforms. So, so basically, this is what I think. The 2K18 version of WWE last year sucked. It was a poor port. Uh, low quality, and it deserved to not receive many sales on the system, which it did not, uh, because it, it was a poor quality game. And now uh, they just want to, I guess, you know, concentrate on just making it for the other system. I, I don't know if uh, they just want, they just thought that you can make a low quality effort on a system and it's going to sell automatically, or that they are really not making the Switch version because they really want to concentrate on improving the quality because it was really poor on the late, you know, the last offering for it. So, um, yeah, also when it comes to 2K, um, they're really bad when it comes to supporting uh, Nintendo systems. Uh, I mean, a game like Grand Theft Auto V could have sold really well on the Switch and they haven't made it available yet. Uh, and they decided to release LA Noir instead. Uh, which is, it was kind of like an odd choice uh, to release on a system. Uh, so I think they purposely are keeping the big guns like the Red Dead Redemptions, like the Grand Theft Autos, away from a system. And the only one that they keep on here uh, is NBA 2K because NBA 2K sells everywhere. Uh, so I don't know. Like, I just think that this is uh, 2K low bowling, another Nintendo system like they always do. Okay, let's start with uh, Grand Theft Auto. You have to understand that Grand Theft Auto is kind of like, it's kind of like the Bigfoot. You think it's out there, Carlos, but you never see it. That's one, <laughs> two. Uh, so, I agree. The reason they're not doing a port is because the port of last year's WWE 2K18 game just was just bad. Like it was bad, and no one bought it. No one cares because people are smart. People are not going to buy a game that runs like crap on the system. And now they're saying they're going to do the excuse. Well, it did not so well enough because they're not going to admit probably that the game ran like crap originally. Right, Kalionis? Now, 
The other thing is, again, it's all about profit margins, Calionis. I said, worth investing the money on doing a switch port that maybe is not going to be that good and not sell because they're not experts on the switch. Or this is maybe one of those companies that went to panic uh, button and said, hey, can you do this port? And they said, no. <laughs> but anyway, just joking aside. Uh, but it, it, it is what it is. They don't, 2K doesn't have a good team to port a Switch game. You almost have to build a team dedicated for the Switch. Is, is it worth the money? That is 2K. And 2K gets a lot of money. They should be fine making a, a 2K uh, Switch team. But you know how it is. It's all about profit margins, Calionis. So it makes sense. I really don't care because I don't play WWE games. I, I barely watch WWE right now. That's how bad it is. Uh, so uh, don't worry. Switch owners, don't worry about it. You're getting better games than this. You're fine. Okay, well, and at least we can discard one, you know, that game as one of the uh, the possible games that we're going to be talking about next. Because the next piece of news is about Panic Button, and they, and they're saying that there are tons of Nintendo Switch projects in development uh, currently. Uh, so you know, they you know, you know how you know Warframe was announced recently. Uh, it's going to be coming over to the Switch. It's going to be, uh, I guess, a free to play uh, game on the system. It is one that has millions of players out already uh, on different systems and it's going to be a really welcome addition uh, on the switch um, of course you know panic button they already have the expertise on the system they've done i guess you can say the impossible job of, of getting games like doom and wolfenstein to to run on the system and look the way it does yes it's not ps4 quality uh or you know xbox one quality but it's still pretty damn good for a portable game um and they've been approached by many companies in you know to get additional projects on um you know to port on the system but they had to say no to a couple of them but still they are working on more ports they've said that they have increased the size of their team and that we're going to see more coming to the switch see this is i'll see it but put it this way this is when you dedicate and you have a dedicated team and they get a handle on the switch structure and then you make good ports. That's again, are you willing to spend the money? Panic Button is probably one of the few companies which just focus on the Switch. So that's why a lot of companies, because they don't want to spend money in their internal studios, Kali, unless they're going to Panic Button to do their ports. But again, it's also exciting because that sounds like Panic Button has more projects. So more third party games are coming to the Switch. Okay, moving over to the next one, and this is you know the type of things that I like to see when it comes to a Nintendo collaboration is that Ubisoft Paris and Milan receives two developed 2018 awards for Mario and Rabbit Kingdom Battle on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, they were winners of animation and visual design at the awards. So this is the type of things that happen. We have two companies willing to go all in uh, on you know, on collaborations and efforts, and they've been doing great. Yep, good for them. Go ahead, Karen. <laughs> Going over to the next one is that Epic's Fortnite adds the gyro and motion controls to the Nintendo Switch version of the game. This was a, uh, an update that came in with Season 5. Um, you know, uh, update that came, you know, I think it's uh, just a couple of days ago. It seems like it's been a while because we've been playing the games for so long uh, in Season 5 as well, just trying to, you know, get all the tiers and the levels and everything. But uh, gyro motion controls, it's something that have been, has been added to games like Doom, like, you know, uh, like Wolfenstein, and now it's on Fortnite as well. So hopefully they're going to continue to do it uh, and that they're going to be found on more. So I think... Um, even though the PS4 and the Xbox One don't doesn't have gyro controls, I think it is the way of the future when it comes to console games, and hopefully we will continue to see it more and more as it develops. Of course, yeah, the the flagship title when it comes to gyro motion controls becomes it's uh, Splatoon 2. That's the one that uses it uh, to the fullest. But I think we will continue to see it even on more games. Uh, so I'm I'm glad that they took the time to optimize and then add it on the system. I thing I'm going to say is I always stated, a lot of people say motion controls are the devil. I always stated that motion controls done right can expand a game. I love Resident Evil 4 on the Wii for that reason, to give you an example, right? So I thought Skyward, Skyward Sword was really good with motion controls too. 
but a lot of people hated that game. Eh. Anyway, good for Fortnite. And that's actually the last piece of news that we have for today, Dantes. Thank you, Cardenas, because we're already in 110, Mark. Oh, my God, what a maneuver. <laughs> so that means that it's time to go quickly, Cardenas, to Chigero's Supermarket. <laughs> So what are the newest and hottest game, Kalionis, coming out to the market? Well, the new and hottest games are, and, and you can count them, so, so we can see if we're getting close to the 20 and 30 releases every week. So for this week, it's going to be Another World, The Lion Song, Shining Resonance Refrain, Never Out, Model Dash, Haunting Simulator, Hotel Transylvania 3, Monsters Overboard, Bomber Crew, 20XX, Super Volley Blast, Star Story, The Horizon Escape, Radio Hammer Station, Johnny Turbo's Arcade Express Raider, Holy Potatoes, A Weapon Shop, Ghost 1.0, Galaxy Variant S, Phil Epic's Phil's Epic Adventure, Bomb Chicken, Neo Geo Super Spy, Voxel Shot for Nintendo Switch, Super Destronaut DX, Epic Loon, Darts Up, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, and Octopath Traveler. Game of the week is Octopath Traveler. I counted 25 games, Calionis. <laughs> 25 games for the week. So, yeah, I mean, I know that. And only, well, only like four <laughs> are worth your time, to clarify. But anyway. Well, we have... I just want to say neither Dantes nor I have played all those games, so we can't really for a fact state that's the reason, but I know that right. there's right. a handful of them. Right. Okay. I'll just leave it at Are that. Are you going to play Phil, uh, Phoenix and Fur Adventure? No, you're not. Shut the hell up. Anyway. That was that one. With, with, that, <laughs> with that said, uh, thank you. We're done with the show. Boom. We're going to quickly get out of here because we're already over time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight on the Get Out and Get Out Nintendo Podcast, episode 52, right here at the Poison Unison Gaming Channel. Please remember to subscribe, like, and comment so you can make these two crazy MFs happy. Also, remember, you can get this podcast on SoundCloud and iTunes for free. Rate us over there so you can show us some love. Also, go to the description box below for a little preview of what we're working, baby. Tune in next Saturday, where we'll be unveiling the future of the Forcing Unison Gaming channel. Also, go to our Facebook page called at Forcing Unison Gaming. And finally, Hernandez says finally. And we forgot to take it away from the uh, uh, thumbnail for the uh, thanks to watching and subscribing. But anyway, let me remove it quickly. <laughs> it's over. Go to forcingunison.wordpress.com and give some clicks and love to my boy Kalionis. With all that said, good night, everybody. I'll leave you with Octopack Traveler there running in the background. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>